Hello, and welcome to Episode 6 of Oside Demystified. I'm your host and council member, Rick Robinson, and I am so excited to be interviewing our guest today. Did you know we have a real live engineer on staff with the city? I mean, I didn't even know we had our own train, and I love trains, and I can't wait to introduce you to our engineer. You don't have a train. What? Are you sure? Well, it looks like this engineer thing may be a bigger mystery than I thought. So get on board with me, and we'll sort it out when we come back. <laughs> All aboard! Pure Water Oceanside and other local programs diversify our water supply to create up to 4.5 million gallons a day of new, local, high-quality drinking water that is clean, safe, drought-proof, environmentally sound, and cost-effective. Well, welcome back, everyone. And as I said, I got corrected. It's not a train engineer. It's actually my friend and city engineer, Brian Thomas. So, Brian, welcome. And I'm glad you're here. But Brian and I both kind of have the same thought on things. So we'll see. He has his own whistle. He came with his own whistle today. I did. And thank you for having me, Rick. I'm glad you're here. So I want to start off, you know, being Oceanside Demystified, we talk about things that people may or may not know about the city and how we operate. And I always found that the field of engineering and the role it plays here in the city, I think, is kind of one of those unseen and unknown disciplines. So would you talk a little bit about, well, introduce yourself and a little bit about yourself and your career path and how you got here to the city of Oceanside? Well, thanks. Um Start off my career as a structural engineer, believe it or not, and started working for a public agency, spent nine years there, and then I went into the private sector, spent almost 20 years there, and then I came back to the public sector. So during my time, I've spent almost 35 years, well, over 35 years in the public sector as one form of engineer or another, usually dealing with infrastructure, public buildings, street storm drain, water supply, and wastewater. So that kind of gets into the question of engineering itself and at the city level. Where do we find engineers? Or can you explain what engineering is maybe to those of us, pretend I don't know, and, and what is engineering? Well, engineering comes from a 13th century or 1300 term uh, engineer, which was somebody who came up with or built engines or machinery and maintained them. And then when trains came along, the UK and the United States took it into their own lexicon and engineer became the one who drove the trains. So there are many different types of engineers out there. Um, the key ones are civil engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and electrical engineering. And within the field I currently practice in civil engineering. We have transportation, general civil, structural engineering, environmental engineering, water and wastewater engineering. So it, it's so many different subsets to it. So a little bit then about career opportunities. And I always like to talk about career opportunities and how individuals who may want to be in the private sector, what's available for them in the public sector. Can you talk a little bit about 
especially here in the city, what are our career opportunities for people in the engineering field? Our career opportunities are many and varied. We have water utilities engineering. We have traffic engineering. We have environmental engineering. And we also have our CIP and land development engineering. Our land development deals with what just exactly what it says is land developments. So anytime you see somebody tearing down a building or grading on a vacant lot, that's development. Our CIP, which is Capital Improvement Program, deals with street repairs, storm drain repairs, curb and And I want to talk a little bit about CIP Mm -hmm. a little later and spend some time going over that because I know that's a real critical piece of what you do. Why does a city need a city engineer? Is that a legal thing? Is it what? Yes. Yes. Um, Under the Business and Profession Code, every city is required to have a licensed engineer in charge of the engineering functions of a city. Also required to have a licensed surveyor. Oh, yeah. um, Either through a consultant or through direct employment. So every city is required to have somebody who's in charge of the public works, the engineering aspects, as well as the land surveying, which deals with property. And in Oceanside, do we have a surveyor? I, I don't, or is that a contract that we do? We have a surveyor. Um, we recently lost him to another agency, and we're working on replacing that individual. So, so if anybody's a surveyor looking for work, come. Absolutely. Nice. What's the city engineer's role or your role when it comes to safety and those kinds of things? Because I think you're involved in safety decisions and things when it comes to building. And mm-hmm. So my role as a city engineer is to make sure that every design that comes through the door meets minimum industry standards, uh, state, federal, and local requirements. So we want to make sure that everything is safe, that it meets current codes. We want to make sure that the paths of travel are safe. We want to make sure that pedestrians can get from point A to point B. Bicyclists are safe on the road. We want to make sure that the roadways are in uh, fair condition. Uh, We work on trying to improve them beyond fair into better condition. And uh, one of our programs is the Pavement Management Program, which we deal with throughout the city. And I want to talk about the pavement management because that is a a question I get as a council member. Mm -hmm. I get that a lot on our our pavement management. But before we go there, I think the way I want to kind of wrap up this intro is where does your department or your division fit in the whole org chart of the city? We are part of the development services division, which encompasses code enforcement, planning, building, and engineering. But as a city engineer, I'm in charge of all the engineering functions in the city, which includes the water utility, capital improvement projects, and traffic engineering. So I'm responsible for the work of three departments and four divisions. Okay. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, How many direct reports do you have or how many people respond or report to you? I have 20 direct reports in just the engineering department. Wow. Let's talk a little bit about some of our projects before we get into the budget, the CIP budget. Well, let's talk about CIP first. You want to explain what a a CIP budget is and why do we have one? Capital Improvement Program budget is our annual budget that tells us what we can do. And as you can see on the the screen here, it's broken up into various different categories, Major X, Parks and Recreation, Grants, Water and Sewer, Harbor Districts. Uh, We have miscellaneous accounts from the city that are general fund. We have special taxes that are funded through SB1, which is gas tax. We also have Transnet, which is our local SANDAG reimbursement to the city. So all of these things go together to create a budget that we operate on an annual basis to make improvements throughout the city. So you developed the CIP, or how is CIP developed? How does that come about? The CIP budget is a collaboration with many departments, uh, finance, um, every department director, and we just figure out what is our base need for the coming year. How do we accomplish that? What do we need to do to get there? Then we look at our total project list and we see what available funding we have. And then we have to make some really hard decisions. If we don't have enough money to fund everything on the list, then we have to start prioritizing those. So with the CIP budget, as we go forward, we had Jill Moya in a, earlier, mm-hmm. our finance director here, talking about that. 
a little bit about our, our budget development and stuff. But you work with our finance division then, right? In the, yes. Because the CIP budget and our city budget is all done at the same time? Yes, we spend months and months pulling it together. Usually our budget starts in November or earlier. With the general fund budget, we start in January or February on that. But because we have so many things that we need to look at, we have to look at what the estimates need for the various projects are. We have to deal with so many different departments to find out what their requests and what their needs are. We have to take a, an earlier step forward on that to move forward with the projects to make sure that we can balance the budget. And we typically, that's a one-year budget? Or it seems like some of these projects go on for years. Right. We budget one year at a time, but we project five years out. So if I know that this year I need to design a new police station, it's going to take a year and a half to design the police station. So we budget that money. We carry the money through next fiscal year as well. If we know what that cost is going to be for the, the police station, we budget it out for however many years, and usually it's a two to three year build. So within our five-year projection, we have the, the money forecasted out, but we only approve the budget on an annual basis. And we go back every July, August, September, and start looking at this again, and are these numbers correct? Do we need to change these numbers? Um, have our costs gone up? And that's one of our very real factors is inflation, supply chain issues. These things affect how much we pay for our goods and services. So sometimes, and I want you to talk a little bit about some of our projects that we've completed and some things that you've talked about our police mm -hmm. headquarters, but often we'll get calls as a city council member, get an email or a call about something going on. Um, you know, the one that comes to mind right away is the water lift station over off of Oceanside Boulevard. I know that's not in your department per se, but part of the reason sometimes those projects go on longer than anticipated is because the costs have changed and we have to change the contracts? Or how does that work? Part of it is cost. Part of it is supply chain. Part of it is unknown field conditions. Um, if we get in there, we start excavating for foundations or installing pipes. The ground may not be what we thought it was. We can take all the borings we want, but our soils borings are only good at that particular location. So two feet away, five feet away, 10 feet away, we could have completely different soil conditions that exist. So we have to look at those. And with the uh, Oceanside Boulevard lift station, that's one of the things that we ran into was this difficulty in getting things moving forward. So when we run into those occurrences, we have to go back. We have to look at it holistically. What's the best fix? How do we make this work in the long term while still being cost effective at the end of the day? So we now have that figured out when we're moving forward with the contractor to get that taken care of. So can you talk a little bit about, share with our audience, some of the projects, maybe things that they have seen in the recent past and some things we have currently going and some of our future projections for projects? Can you just kind of let our folks know what we got going? Sure. One of our most recent projects that we just recently completed was uh, the beachfront right below our newest hotels. So that, what did that was, consist of? Was that, that is uh, a new maintenance building, brand new restrooms, a uh, new police substation, and a nice little courtyard uh, for sitting and watching the waves just right across the street from, from the beach, right at the pier. So we're looking at phase two beachfront improvements, which will include upgrading and updates to the amphitheater looking at improvements to the Junior Sale Community Center. And we're also looking concurrently to work and repair the concrete portion of the bridge for the pier. But that's a separate project. That's right? a separate project, but they're being run together because it makes sense to do it all holistically and right. take care of it all together. Right. Uh, some of the other projects that we just completed was the El Corazon, or now the Ralph Wagner Pool Aquatic Center. That was... Uh, project of mine. And I'm very proud That's of That's right. The, I was going to say that. Was... Very proud of that project. So some of the things coming in the future, Fire Station 1 is under construction with the help of a DOD grant. Um, we've got a uh, Fire Station 8 under design. We've got the police department in the, the preliminary design works. Um, Can you share a little bit about the police? I know 
we talked to Chief Armio prior to his retirement, and he we talked a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. But can you share where's that anticipated to go, and what will it house? Right now, we're looking to bring everything that is currently offsite under one roof. So evidence storage, um, training facilities, things along those lines. And the place we're looking at is on city-owned property across the street from El Corazon, uh, right where Dr. Labonte Drive is and Rancho Del Oro okay. on the northeast corner of it in that vacant lot. Right now, the city currently leases it out as a trucking school. So we'd be looking to capitalize on that project and, and build a three-story building there, complete with a parking structure and parking uh, for visitors. And that's partly Measure X funded, is that? The only Measure X on that is design. Is the design. So we're currently looking at other funding opportunities. Um, We're also actively pursuing grants, especially through the Department of Defense. So we'll do the design and then we have to find a, come up with a funding plan, right? And that's part of the CIP. You'd come to council with that and then we'd look and, and approve that, right? Correct. Probably, what, three to five years before we see that? Mm, About three years, four years, depending on financing, however we can work that. What other projects do we have, you think, Uh, see in the future? Well, we still have our annual Overlane Slurry Seal project. So, so, okay, here's the mystery. (laughs) I get this all the time. Glad you brought that up. How do we decide which streets, which potholes do we fill, which streets get surfaced, which get replaced because a lot of folks out there think that nothing gets done on our streets. Well, a lot of it's self and magic, but (laughs) Um, we actually have a a program called the pavement management program. And we're currently going to be coming to city council and ask for an update. So this is a mechanical evaluation of our streets using uh, ground penetrating radar, deflectometers, and a whole bunch of different things that we use to determine what the condition of the street is in. And using the the results of the, the analysis, we come up with what's called a pavement condition index or a PCI. And the closer to 100 that number is, the better the street is. Okay. So... Last time we did it, the average PCI of the city was about a 63. Right now, we're close to about a 59. But we've spent an enormous amount of money over the last four years that I've been here in tackling various things. Used to be the program was we would go in and we would just, okay, these people have lodged complaints. Let's go in and take care of their streets. So what we've done is a more comprehensive approach to it. So every district gets some attention every year. So we look at not only the residential area, but we look at commercial and arterials and the collector streets. So how do we get people from neighborhood A to neighborhood B So we're taking care of those streets and repairing them either with overlays, with um, complete repair, or with slurry seal. So we determine what gets a slurry seal versus an overlay. If it's a relatively newer street then and it has a higher PCI, we put a slurry seal on it. And the slurry seal is there to really prolong the street life another five to seven years. If it's got a bunch of potholes in it, if the street's got cracks in it, if it looks like an alligator's back, then that's a candidate for a street to come in and repair it. So we have a number of ways of doing that. We can either do a full depth reclamation where we come in and we actually grind the asphalt and the sub base in place, rebuild the, the street section, and then come in and place a brand new layer of asphalt on top of it. We can dig everything out and then do the same process by adding new sub base and repaving it. Or we just come in and grind it down two inches and put a new layer of asphalt on. And it really depends on what condition the street's in. So the more alligator cracks we have, the less opportunity we have to come in and deal with it. So how does a pothole form? Potholes Good happen. question. How does a pothole form? So potholes form because the subgrade underneath has failed. And that's because cracks get in the asphalt, water penetrates it, and as traffic drives over it, it creates uh, an up and down motion on the pavement. 
and it just pushes the water deeper into the, the sub base. And we don't have the best soils in Oceanside. We have the best beaches, but we don't have the best soils. <laughs> so as these things get wet, if it's a high clay area, the clay swells and causes the street to heave. If it's sandy or if it's just gunk underneath there, then it creates these voids where the asphalt starts to fall away. And that's where the potholes come. And then as the crack gets bigger and bigger, it starts to turn into these little alligators. And then the asphalt starts popping out of the pavement. And that's where we get potholes. So would you say this last, we had the storms a few months ago, it just seems like yesterday, but <laughs> a few months ago, we got a lot of rain, more than we were used to. Correct. Do you think that's directly accounting for the condition of our some of our streets today. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So we had streets that were um, fair to marginal condition and with the abundant rain that we got and the traffic that we got due to a variety of reasons, it just continued to beat the, the subgrade and it continued to allow potholes to develop. I think our public works department this year dealt with more than 2,000 potholes, which is more than average. Do we have crews internally that do all our road work, or how does that how does that happen, or we contract most of that work out? We have a street crew that will come through and take care of most of the potholes. They can't get to a lot of them, but we also do have the annual program that we contract out because that's in millions of dollars, and we have professional contractors come in and deal with those streets. So that gets back to that CIP. You're trying to project that kind of money, the money that's needed, those millions of dollars every year. Correct. So sometimes you have to come back to council and mm -hmm. like probably this year you did, I would think. Yes. And, and we're coming back again. Oh, no. <laughs> so if somebody really felt that they had, uh, I don't know, I'm kind of focusing on our roads a little bit, but that is one of the areas that I, I get a lot of inquiries about. If a member of the public had their street road or whatever near the and it's really bad shape what's the best way for them to get attention to that best way to get a hold of that is to file um, a statement with public stuff that we have through the city that will get routed to either me or to public works um, they can request that engineering staff go out and look at the street um, a lot of requests we get internally is when will my street be paved and again, so we look at this pavement management program. It gives us an idea of what our pavement condition index is. So we have a pot of money that we deal with. What can we do? What's slurry seal? What's overlay? And then we start looking at those streets at that point. So if we get a request in, we go out and look at it. Okay, you're not in the program, but this street does or does not merit a, a second look. And we can either put it in with this year's program or we can move it up in next year's program because the, the pavement management program is something we do every five years or so. So things happen, field conditions change, and this is a point in time analysis. When this happened, when the, the analysis was uh, conducted, that's what the pavement condition index was at that time doesn't continue to evaluate anything beyond that. I mean, the program algorithms will age yeah. the street, but that doesn't always deal with it correctly. So, In the few minutes we have left, I just wanted to touch on, because I think the flooding brought some very dangerous conditions here to Oceanside, and we did have a landslide mm -hmm. here in Oceanside. You were uh, responsible for overseeing that. Um, what happened there, if you can, in just a minute or two? The uh, landslide was caused by oversaturation of a slip plane in an ancient landslide area. Okay. Uh, that's simple as it can be. It just got too wet, and when clay gets wet, it becomes very slippery. And that's what that slide plane was, was a clay layer. And as the engineer, that's one of those safety issues that you had, a project that you had to take on and... Make sure that the work was Correct. contracted out appropriately. Mm -hmm. You or your staff were out there probably over doing oversight and stuff. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. You know, I just want to give you, a, a, in our final minute, is there anything that as far as 
en- from an engineering perspective that you would want people to know here, our, our residents about engineering, about the city, about things that you might oversee that you, you would? Well, we're, we're here for, for the residents. I'm a resident as well. Um, I want the city to be as safe as possible. If you see something that you feel is unsafe, we're happy to go out and look at it. I mean, that's what we're about. We're here to serve you as the community. As far as engineers go, uh, we're always looking for good people. The, the best talent lies out there somewhere. Just come in and apply. We're hiring. I mean, yes, quite a, right now. I think. Or, yes, I have uh, several positions open right now. So, so if um, you want to work for a great city and fun staff, mm-hmm. uh, I know they have fun over there. I've been over there and watched <laughs> the fun. Well, that's really all I have, and I, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day. I know it's busy, and to get you here in the studio takes you away from some of the things you're doing, and I appreciate as the city engineer the special role that that you play in ensuring that one the many projects we have are done appropriately keeps us legal and out of court and and those kind of things and that uh, the safety component of your job i think is often understated so with that i want to thank you and i know you're excited about engineering as i am so i think we should give our real engineers out there a send off Thank you, everybody. Thank you. See you next time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Patrick Young. I'm with the City of Oceanside Parks and Recreation. I'm standing here at the El Corazon Event Center in beautiful Oceanside, California. It's a 5,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility that can accommodate any type of event imaginable, whether it be a corporate function, weddings, family reunions, any type of special event. The facility has an indoor-outdoor area for your ceremony and cocktail hour. The indoor space comes fully equipped with audio, visual, tables, chairs, and anything to meet your event needs. If you'd like to arrange a tour or have any questions, please contact 760-435-5244 to arrange a tour or go to OceansideRec.com. Located hillside on Mesa Drive in Oceanside, Buddy Todd Park is known for its beautiful ocean breezes, established trees, and plenty of space. Developed nearly a century ago in 1929, it is Oceanside's oldest park. Originally named Parnassus Circle, it was later renamed in 1946 for John Buddy Todd the first Oceanside resident to pass in World War II. Buddy Todd Park offers 19 acres of panoramic views, a multi-purpose field, picnic areas, restroom facilities, children's playgrounds, and beautiful walking paths. Buddy Todd Park is open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Visit today. I hope you learned as much as I did about the role of our city engineer. I found it fascinating the field of engineering is so critical to the day-to-day operation of the city. Now, Brian is a great guy, but I still wish we had our own train. Then maybe I too could be an engineer. If you have any suggestions or topics or questions for any of our guests, text them to me at 760-216-7587 or visit oside2.com until next time remember that oside is a great place to live work and recreate don't make it a mystery i'm your council member rick robinson mm-hmm.